the number one pornography and adult film website, Pornhub, just released their official website traffic report for the year 2022, and the results were shocking. They reveal the deep-rooted spiritual sickness plaguing the entire world today, especially the United States, which is the number one country by far downloading and consuming porn. The U.S. had more than double the porn usage of the U.K., which landed number two on the list. Webroot.com published an article called Internet Pornography by the Numbers, a Significant Threat to Society, where they reveal that 40 million Americans regularly visit porn sites, which is more than 10% of the nation's population. They also found that pornography use increased the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%, and 68% of divorce cases involve one party meeting a new paramour over the internet, while 56 involve one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. The problem with porn is that it's not thought of like other addictions and substances that are treated criminally. If you're an alcoholic, you have to physically go somewhere to purchase your fix. And the same goes for any literal physical substance. Porn is the visual drug. Available 24-7, 365, as long as someone has a smartphone or internet connection, its use is limited only by the amount of free time someone has on their hands. What many fail to realize is that by consuming porn, even simply visiting websites, they are contributing to an entire industry that uses and abuses vulnerable people, especially women and children. Just a simple search for Pornhub-related content on the Daily Wire reveals numerous articles involving lawsuits, exploitation of children, sex trafficking, rape scenes, and many other atrocities that are tied directly to Pornhub. Illegal and downright evil content is uploaded to their website with victims reporting attempted suicide over the horrific shame caused by Pornhub. Today, we are going to overcome this problem once and for all. Today, I am going to reveal the secret to overcoming the new drug of our generation. The scriptures have already warned us that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, without self-control, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. We are in the last days, and it is now time to rise up, overcome this spiritual darkness, and live the abundant life that Jesus promised for his followers. Get ready. Welcome back to Overcome Babylon. I'm Abraham Ojeda. Today we are talking about something that a lot of people don't want to talk about. There's a lot of shame and a lot of, I don't know, it's secrecy with this particular issue in our society right now. And um, the real focus today, though, is going to be unlocking the true power of of the Word of God in your life. And so this doesn't just apply to pornography addiction. It applies to any addiction and really any any closet, secret sin, pet sin. Uh, it really is a full spectrum uh, approach, but we're just gonna, I'm gonna use pornography today as a case study uh, to really dive into how to apply the Word of God and how to use the wisdom of the Word of God and principles to overcome, in this case, addictions and porn addiction being the, the key focus. Before we get into that, uh, again, countdown timer down below shows us that we are 264 days away from the abomination of desolation. Go check that out uh, on the website, overcomebabylon.com. Download the free report that I have for you, and you can figure all that out and fact check it for yourself. So, pornography addiction. Um, like I said, today, what I'm talking about doesn't just apply to pornography addiction. Any kind of addiction, drugs, alcohol, you name it. Um, because we're using the Word of God and the principles that we're going to be talking about today are timeless principles. They're ancient principles. It's an ancient text we're going to be looking at today. And um, yeah, before we dive in, this, this particular topic is something that, um, you know, it's definitely a year ago, two years ago, I wouldn't be talking about this because I hadn't quite figured out how to overcome m pornography addiction in my own life, okay? And... Um, you know, we all have different backgrounds, but I feel like, um, I, I, you know, as, as I began opening up about this particular topic and just started talking to people about my, my experiences, my life experiences, I found that people, we've all been through some crap. Like for me growing up, I, uh, I was, I just was exposed to sexuality in a, in a negative wrong way, uh, without going into many details, long story short, somebody that was, you know, close to me, you know, did something sexually twisted when I was really young, had no clue what to even think, couldn't even process those emotions at the time. But so my introduction to sexuality was really twisted. 
And then, you know, later on, a family member's like, hey, have you heard of pornography or porno? We, he, he called it porno. Like, yeah, check this out, you know, whatever. And I was like, cool, if that's what guys do, then that's, you know, awesome. Because he was older than me, and, you know, I thought it was, like, that's what older kids do. Like, and I must have been, gosh, I must have been, like, 12, 13, whatever. And so sexuality was kind of pushed on me at an early age by somebody else. Then the porno was introduced, like, super young. And then, you know, people talk about it at school and it's just like one thing leads to another. And it's just kind of, and what I feel these days is become kind of a cultural norm. Like there's no, there's no, I don't know. People are becoming more bold about, uh, porn. Like Hollywood obviously has played a huge role in popularizing it, making it normalizing pornography use. Like I can think of like three or four movies off the top of my head that I saw because I don't really watch movies anymore, but because I, I can't stand Hollywood, but, um, you know, the movies that the kind of movies, the kind of media that I, I was exposed to growing up, like they're always kind of like making jokes about it or insinuating that it's good. Like pornography can relax you and all these kinds of things. And so, um, you know, I, for the longest time, I would justify the behavior, uh, by, you know, reciting those things, those, those things that the enemy had planted in my mind. But, you know, as we keep growing in this walk of faith, there comes a point where it's like, you know what? Enough is enough. And like I like I kind of alluded to, um, you know, I, there's some statistics that I showed for 2022 and Pornhub and all that. And I can honestly say that I have not been a part of those statistics because I've been clean and I've been able to walk away from porn. And But I think the reason why it took me so long, honestly, you know, being a believer, you know, being a Christian since probably age 16, 17 right around there. Um, first heard the gospel when I was 15, but I think why, what took so long is that, um, really there's, there was nobody I felt that I could trust to really lean into and talk to and open up about this. And, uh, I think the isolation is a big issue for a lot of people. It definitely was for me, um, feeling isolated, feeling that you have nobody to talk to a mentor or somebody to kind of help you counsel you through this. Um, and so what this video today is going to be though, is to show you how, even though it, it might seem kind of like an abstract thing, you can't really wrap your mind around it, but I'm going to tell you right now with 100% full conviction that the word of God is absolutely sufficient for everything in your life, for, for instructions, for, for overcoming the deepest, darkest parts of you, addictions, pornography addiction, the word of God is sufficient. It is so powerful. And what I'm going to show you today is something that I, it took me so long to discover. And, and I think the reason why it took so long is because, like I said, I didn't have maybe that, that circle of friends, that direction, that mentorship thing going on that, you know, because quite frankly, um, like I had mentioned in the, in previous episode, previous podcasts, I had, I had gone to, um, a really legalistic, like Baptist college. And I, I kind of was surrounded with that group for a long time, the Baptists. Um, but even, you know, even some Protestant evangelical types that are not, they don't claim Baptists. Like there's a lot of condemnation and there's a lot of guilt and loathing and, 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 and just judgmental type of things that, that, that can really arise. And I was always really, I, I saw it, definitely saw it in the, in the Baptist churches. But I always felt like like there was never a real opportunity um, to to bring this uh, to somebody else, which, you know, thinking back now, really what I should have been doing uh, more and more uh, in a focused way is just bringing it to God and be like, hey, how do I deal with this? I think that's a, a big problem as well, is that a lot of us view God as somebody who is like going to strike us with the hammer of judgment um, he's pissed off. Uh, a lot of people portray God like that. Um, and, and what I'm going to show you today also is the character of God and how he actually does want to work with you and I through addictions, through our problems. He knew, he knew, he knows the heart. Okay. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? But God, God can know the heart. And he is actually the one that, that he died on a cross for us. And rose again. He wants to work with us. He wants to make a spotless bride ready. He he wants to work with people, but it's our own selves, it's our own guilt, shame, and loathing that keep us from understanding, accepting, and thriving, even in the midst of all of our issues, growing, thriving, getting 
cleaner and more spotless and coming out of addiction. It's our own selves that get in the way of God's grace. And so we're also going to talk a lot about God's grace because uh, if you're a recovering addict, uh, you're going to need it. Uh, you're going to need to understand grace. Otherwise, you're, you're always going to be stuck in the condemnation zone where you're just constantly beating yourself down and you're not going to get anywhere. Okay, so first thing we, we're, we're going to be looking at today is, yes, unlocking the true power of God's word. That's the main focus for today. What I want to point out to you, though, is that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, it actually does not say anything about pornography addiction. Uh, this is what it says. I'm just. This is an excerpt that I took from their book here, from the American Psychiatric Association. Excessive use of internet, not involving the playing of online games, for example, excessive use of social media such as Facebook, viewing pornography online, is not considered analogous to internet gaming disorder. And future research on other excessive uses of the internet would need to follow similar guidelines as blah blah blah. The point is, the point is. If you go to your doctor, if you go to Western medicine, if you actually try to seek help from from somebody on, on a professional level, um, pornography addiction is actually not even classified as a legitimate diagnosable disorder or disease. Weirdly, oddly enough, internet uh, gaming is and gambling is and those types of addictions are, but pornography isn't. So um, if you felt stuck, trapped, and felt like you know, the wisdom of the world let you down, the world failed you, and there's just, there's just nowhere to go. You come to the right place because we're going to talk about how the Word of God is simple and effective. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I fear, this is Paul sp- speaking, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And what I'm going to submit to you today is that the reason that pornography is such an issue in our society right now particularly the United States, is because that serpent is whispering things in your ear and saying, hey, have you thought about, hey, you need to relax. Hey, you know, hey, it's going to make you feel good. Hey, you know, you really should check out some porn. And and people are being deceived by the serpent to this day. This is spiritual warfare 100%. We'll talk more about the demonic dimension of spiritual warfare in the next episode. But the simplicity of what I'm going to show you today, it's so simple. It's so simple, yet so profound. But Paul, again, he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. What you're going to find in the world is that people are desperately trying to figure out how to overcome addictions, how to overcome disorders, and all these little things that they want to label. Really, it's just sin. How do we overcome sin? Um, you're not going to be able to overcome sin apart from the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge, applying the Word of God in your life. It's just not going to happen. I mean, yes, people have have breakthroughs. They go to rehab. They do all these sorts of things, and they can get clean of an addiction. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God that you're reciting in your mind can set you free in an instant without having to go through months or perhaps years of rehab or whatever it is. And I just want you to t- check out what Eli Nash says here. Uh, Ellie, he, he's, he's a Jewish guy. He, ta- he has a really interesting kind of take uh, on, on how he got... Well, he actually calls himself a porn addict, as I'll play in this little clip here. He still calls himself a porn addict, but he's a recovering porn addict. And uh, listen to the fleshly wisdom, the worldly wisdom, that uh, what he's saying here, eh, probably not going to work. Let's, let's just take a look at what he has to say. My name is Ellie Nash. I'm a porn addict. And I want to thank you because there's no better way I've found than this, sharing my story in front of an accepting room, accepting audience. To hit or to give me the best chance of achieving my number one goal, to never watch porn again. Thank you so much. So did you catch that? Like he's saying that getting on a stage or like telling people his story and like talking about how being a porn addict is going to help him overcome being a porn addict. No, I'm sorry. It's yeah, it's it, the first step to recovery is to admit you have a problem. hundred percent, hundred percent. You have to admit that you have a problem. 
uh, but just admitting you have a problem over and over and over again isn't the solution. So today we're going to talk about how this particular Psalm 119, this is our primary text. This is our foundational text for today's study. And there it is on the screen. <laughs> the Hebrew right there for us. Look, it, it, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but you have to go back to the original language. If you really want to see all of the nuances, all of the deeper, richer meaning of the Word of God, and let it really, really work in your life, you have to go back to the original Hebrew. And look, I'm not saying that salvation comes by, through head knowledge of understanding languages that are not our language, like I speak English, right? I'm not saying that salvation comes through understanding the Hebrew and understanding the Greek and all that. What I'm saying is, is that the deep wisdom, the deep things of God, he, you know, we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about learning the intricate meanings. And you know what? It used to be that we had to go to a seminary or we had to go to a college. Like I, I went to a Bible, a Christian college. It was, I got my four-year degree in chemistry, but, uh, or my biochemistry, whatever biology, uh, <laughs> I even forget. It's been a while. I forget what my degree was in, but, um, we, we go, you know, I went to a, a four-year college where I had to take Bible courses and all that. Um, but what I'm going to say is you don't have to go through all those hoops. You don't have to, uh, regurgitate people, other people's ideas about the Bible, write them down and you got an A on the test. You don't have to go through all that, that headache. You can go straight on some resources. I'll share my favorite resource in a moment. You can actually study the word of God for yourself in the original language without having to know the original language. And what the Psalm 119 verse 11 says is your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is, like I said, the primary, fundamental, foundational text for what we're going to be talking about today. And before we go forward, though, I have to talk about the rules of interpreting Scripture. Because, again, what I want to show you today are principles. What I want to show you are principles you can apply to multiple situations. Obviously, pornography is something that, uh, well, overcoming pornography addiction is something that I'm very passionate about. Because it's something that I recently overcame in my own life. And so I'm very passionate about that. But like I said, this can be applied to pretty much any area of your life. Okay. Law of first mention. Okay. This is the first fundamental rule that we have to follow. The original text of the Bible has been preserved in, uh, as Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. Because the Hebrew scriptures came first, well, guess what? They determine all scripture interpretation from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. We're just going to be really focusing on the Hebrew and, and understanding the Hebrew mind because that's the foundation. Okay. Now, when a word uh, Hebrew word appears in the text for the very first time, then the, that usage of the word is extremely important uh, for understanding the meaning that the Holy Spirit breathed for that word throughout the rest of the text. Now, please don't misunderstand me. The Greek is important. Yes, the Greek is amazing. We have a Greek New Testament for a reason. All I'm saying is that Hebrew is first. We look at the Hebrew, 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 Hebrew. And law of definitions is number two. In order to understand the meaning of a verse or passage, the definitions of each and every single word should be looked up in order to fully and completely understand what is being said. Um, in order to find the originally intended meaning in the text, you need a concordance. Okay, I mentioned this a moment ago. One of the best free concordances is Blue Letter Bible. Go to blueletterbible.org. There are others like eSword. They're free. There's a lot of other resources. Just I like Blue Letter Bible. That's what I'm going to be using today, and I'll show you some screenshots. Law of Context. Law of context. You have to do something right now if you have not already. You have to leave your religious baggage at the door. Whatever your church, your denomination, your pastor told you about the Bible, you just got to gotta set that aside. You got to leave your religious baggage at the door when you're walking into this place of interpreting Scripture with fresh eyes to see what it actually has to say rather than what you want it to say or what you were told that it says, okay? And the, the second part of the law of context is that for whatever verse or passage that we are looking at, you have to look at the verses before and after it in order to understand the proper context. So those are our three rules. Definition, uh, law of first mention, law of definitions, law of context. Now, now that we've understood that, let's go back to our primary text here. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Like I mentioned already, pornography is a huge sin. It's destroying. It's literally decaying our society from the inside out. How do we overcome it? Well, it says we have to hide the word in our heart. That's what the psalmist is writing. And so when we look at the Hebrew words, the first one is belibi, in my heart. Interesting. I'll make a comment about that in a moment. But in my heart, zapanti, I've hid, or have I hid, uh, imrateka, your word, uh, lechma'an, that, lo, not, uh, echeta, I might sin, lach, against you. So I know you, I already made like mention to it, but do you see the really key part here? 
of, of what, what I'm showing you on the screen here is that it's in my heart have I hid your word that, I, that not I might sin against you. We have to start with the heart, okay? Now, like I said, this, I'm really passionate about this topic, and I just want to share my story a little bit more. Um, like I had mentioned, I went to a four-year Christian college, uh, Fundamental Independent Southern Baptist, and the Southern Baptists are, are uh, really cool, but the fundamental ones, uh, the IFB, uh, pretty pretty uh, legalistic with, and what I mean by legalistic is bringing outside traditions that are outside of the Bible and, and treating them just on the same level, just as important as the Bible itself, okay? So one of the things that they said, like the fundamentals of the, that, this particular independent Baptist, Southern Baptist sect, religious denomination, is that they're King James Version only, okay? Um, uh, another one is that women must wear uh, dresses, skirts can't be too, like too short. They have to wear like dresses or skirts, but definitely not short skirts. Uh, but for a woman to wear pants, that's cross-dressing, okay? Um, and they, they had all these different rules. And uh, so it was a strict setting, right? It was a very strict setting. And every student that attended that college, myself included, we all, every semester, we were required to take Bible classes, and there's specific ones we're all required to take. Um, uh, yeah, I believe PCC, first semester. Anyways, New Testament. I think you start with the New Testament. Then you do Old Testament survey. Then like you go through these different courses. You do surveys of the Bible. Then you start going through uh, Life of Christ. You go through David. And you go through all these different uh, uh, courses. And through each one of these courses, we're all, every single one of us, um, to get our degrees, and even if you're an engineer or a nurse or, or whatever, if you want to be a doctor, uh, you have to memorize Bible verses, okay? And um, what, I, what I realized, and again, I'm not bashing this particular school, my alma mater. I'm not bashing PCC. Um, I'm, not, I'm not hating. I'm just pointing out the, the facts here that um, when, when it didn't matter if it was people that left after their freshman year, sophomore year, because people would just kind of drop out of the school because they're like, okay, I've had enough of this, like this atmosphere, the having, you know, the guys would have to wear, we would wear suits and ties uh, for church. What, how many times a week? I forget. It was a lot. Um, uh, we had to, you know, we had, there's a dress code. You couldn't have a, you know, a beard. You couldn't have long hair or whatever. Like they had all these extra biblical traditions, legalistic things that are men's traditions. And so people would be like, you know, I'm done. Like first semester, like first semester, or definitely after the second semester of freshman year, that's when you saw the most people drop off. Um, you know, their parents wanted them to go there, so they wanted to make their parents happy. You know, so they they went to the school, but they didn't stick around. Then you had the sophomore people kind of drop out, but you know, usually by the time you get to sophomore year, people will kind of stick around and do their whole four year degree. Um, but what I noticed in my in my personal uh, just experience is that senior year comes around. Hey, we graduate. You know, we're in our cap and gowns. You know, life is good. And people kind of go their separate ways. What I, what I what I noticed, you know, just just immediately, immediately after leaving that strict setting, is that uh, I saw some tr kind of disturbing trends. People would, they would become more hedonistic. If you don't know what hedonism means, it means doing whatever they want, like doing do what thou wilt, which is what Aleister Crowley, the father of modern Satanism, taught. Like people would, they would go from this strict setting of Bible classes getting your degree, going to church a million times a week. I think it was at least six times a week. I can't remember. But like all this rigor, all this strict setting, this atmosphere. And when they leave the college, whether they leave early on or they leave later on, but especially if they left later on, they've memorized even more Bible. Like the Bible is in their head. The Bible is in their head. But you know, like just to share a little bit of, of my personal in interaction, like there's particular uh, group of buddies. Some of them became like they started drinking a lot. Some, you know, some, some guys, you know, they started, like, I noticed certain trends, like they're just started doing whatever, like things that the college definitely were against, but things that even the Bible was against, like dr being drunken, drunkenness, or, you know, just, just being absorbed into pop culture or being absorbed into the latest, whatever, um, you know, uh, I, you know, birth control, whatever. Like I saw all these things, I saw all of these issues where people would leave this strict setting whether it was early on, definitely if it was later on, and they would kind of just do whatever was right in their own eyes. It's like, wait a minute, I thought you, I thought you memorized scripture. I thought like, I thought like, how, how can you memorize scripture and do all these things, get to your junior or senior year of this college, and then like, just like forget it all? Like, how does that even work? 
the, you can memorize the Bible. You can memorize the whole thing all, from the front all the way to the back. You can have not, had knowledge of the Word of God. But what the Psalm 119 is saying is that it has to be in our heart. In our heart, in my heart, I have hid your word that I might not sin against you. It starts with the heart. Head knowledge of the scriptures is not good enough. And I'm going to show you how we can, we can hide it in our heart. Because what does it mean to hide? Your word I've hidden in my heart. Uh, this particular word is strong, 6845. It means to lay up, to treasure, to store up, to be hidden from discovery. And when you look at the first place that this Hebrew word is used for hidden here in Psalm 119, this Hebrew word is used for the first time in Exodus 2 too. Again, we have to go to the law of first mention. This is what it says, uh, Exodus 2 verse 1, just to read the verse before it. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Um, now you have to understand the importance of the, of the context of this passage. Again, the law of context. So this is what it says in Exodus 1, 22. Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. So Pharaoh decreed that all Hebrew males were to be killed during this time. And the reason that he made this decree is because he was legitimately worried and fearful and was on a power trip that because the Hebrew, the Israelites, all 12 tribes there in, in Egypt at this time, after Joseph had died, they were becoming so numerous and powerful. And he got stressed out about that. He's like, what if we go to war with our enemies and these Hebrews that just keep multiplying, they're having tons of kids and they're becoming a great people. What if they join our enemies and become a military uh, ally of our enemies and then overthrow us. So he's like, let's just start killing them off. And we are going to kill the men. We're going to kill all the baby boys. Okay. And so when we, when you understand the context, you go back and you we read verse three uh, of the, the mother of this child. Uh, when she, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Obviously, this is the story of Moses. Moses eventually becomes the daughter of Pharaoh's son. Uh, and he becomes great and eventually goes to the wilderness. And then he's called into the biggest ministry, probably the biggest ministry besides Yeshua in the entire Bible. And so what it means to hide, what it means to hide based off the law of first mention is to put something away where the enemy where an enemy cannot get to it, where Satan and his, his, his minions cannot get to it, because that's exactly what Yeshua told us. Okay, Matthew 13, verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. But some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, privately, he told his disciples the actual meaning of this uh, parable. And this is what it says in Matthew 13, 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred and some sixty and some thirty, hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So 
do you, you're starting to get the idea of like hiding the word, okay, from the enemy. Um, Jesus makes it really clear here that the birds is the wicked one that comes. Some seed falls by the wayside. And when that happens, someone hears the word of God, but doesn't understand it. And then the wicked one just comes and snatches it away. And that's exactly what happened, unfortunately, to a lot of people that attended college with me. So many of them memorized the Bible. They We were exposed to Bible, like I said, like six times a week at least. If you didn't attend the campus church, uh, you're getting kicked out. Like you get demerits, you get kicked out if you don't go to the campus church. Like we were required to go to church multiple times a week. It was mandatory. We would hear the word of God. But you know what? Something happened where the enemy was able to just come and take that word away. No problem. You know, and a lot, like I said, like a lot of people have different sins that they just gravitated towards as soon as they left college. You know, some were experimented with Eastern religions and different types of pagan things. And it's just people just walked away from the simplicity of the word of God. And so what it says in Psalm 119.9, if we look at two verses before Psalm 119.11, which is our primary verse for today, this is what it says. How can a young man or woman, right? But in this case, in this case, it's man. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word, with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. And so, here is the secret that most people just don't get it. They just don't get it. But you, hopefully, are going to get it once I'm done explaining, if you have not already. But the word made flesh, Yeshua the Messiah, he made it really, really clear. He made it really, really clear how we're supposed to do war. Because make no mistake, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, this is spiritual warfare. Pornography and the temptation or the suggestive uh, uh, enticement from the devil or even your own flesh, this is a spiritual warfare situation. And we already have a clear example of how we're supposed to do war from Matthew chapter 4. This is what it says in verse 3. Now, when the tempter, some translations translation say Satan or Hasatan, when the tempter came to him, Yeshua, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And what most people don't realize, most people don't realize, what was he quoting? He was quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. It's kind of a, a historical recount of some things that happened in the past. And this is what Moses says. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yehovah. Are you starting to get where I'm going with this? Listen, the question we need to be asking ourselves right now in order to overcome porn addiction, alcohol addiction, but specifically porn addiction we need to ask ourselves the question, what does Moses say about porn? Again, when the psalmist said in Psalm 119 verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, he, the New Testament wasn't even written yet. Okay? Now don't take it the wrong way. Don't get it all twisted now. I'm not saying the New Testament is not important. I just quoted the New Testament. I just quoted Matthew chapter 4 a moment ago. The New Testament is amazing. What I'm saying is, even Yeshua, even Jesus quoted the Torah when he was engaging in spiritual warfare. Be, you know, in a fasted state, be, taking his flesh to like the maximum limit. He used the word, every word that proceeded the mouth of God. And you know, the problem today is that most people are stuck in bondage over a lot of things because we don't care what Genesis through Deuteronomy has to say anymore. We don't really care. We don't really look at it as Westerners. I'm speaking mostly of the Westerners here, right? Which, uh, where are the statistics? Like at the intro of this video, where's the number one problem? Where's the number one porn consumption coming from? It's the United States. We do not, as a society, care at all what Moses has to say, except maybe something that makes us feel good, or maybe a, a bedtime story for our kids, for the for the Christian community. They like to tell, talk about Noah's flood, and have a little boat, little stuffed animal boat with a bunch of stuffed animals in the boat. I mean, let's face it, most people these days are agnostic or atheist or whatever, and that you know I understand that because Christianity has really misrepresented the God of the Bible in so many different ways. But my point is, is that religions of all kinds, 
mainstream Christianity, Baptists, Evangelicals, Protestants, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witness, Catholic, so many people are powerless against this fight of spiritual warfare because they don't take a, the moment to look at what Moses actually says about everything, not just porn, but everything. And when you look at what Moses says about, about porn, you are going to be absolutely transformed by the word of God because the power is in every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now, this is what it says in Genesis 34, verse 1. By the way, I should, I should clear this up just in case you might be a, a new listener or whatever. But um, Moses, when I say Moses, I mean Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those first five books commonly understood as written by Moses. Jesus even said, hey, this is Moses. He quoted Moses. He said, Moses has said, has Moses not said? So that's where we get that whole idea, obviously. Um, and and then there's the the prophets and there's all these, the writings, Psalms, Proverbs, like all that's really good. Um, so anyways, but what I'm saying is the foundation from which we need to interpret all of scripture is Moses. And this is what it says in Genesis 34, verse one. This is where we actually see the first rape. Um, now, Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. That word is Anna and raped her. OK, so why, why, why do I go from pornography to rape? Well, as I as I showed you in the intro, uh, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the porn out there it, it literally rape scenes, uh, according to these lawsuits and articles that I'm reading like women are being raped and then they're uploading it to, to these websites. And, uh, and just understand this is what the word of God has to say about this. Now it came to pass, this is Genesis 34, 25. Now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain. Okay. Here's what here. Let me give you a little context. I'm not going to read the whole thing because I, I want to get through some other texts here, but, um, so Dina was raped, which is Jacob's daughter. Uh, she was, it says violated, but really she, he, he she was raped by Shechem. And it turns out that Shechem's like, you know, uh, I kind of like her. I, I want her to be my wife. And so they make this kind of word of mouth agreement with Jacob. And they're like, yeah, you, you know, we'll give you our daughters. You give us your daughters. You know, it's all good. We'll, we'll dwell together. We'll be one people. And what Jacob and his son say is like, no, you got to be circumcised because we're Hebrews and Hebrews are circumcised. So when it says it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain, the men of that town who were not circumcised that wanted to go into basically a covenant with Jacob and his sons, uh, Israel, uh, they were in pain because they just became circumcised as grown men, which <laughs> that would be pretty painful stuff. Um, and then it says this, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. So while the, these guys were in a vulnerable state, just being freshly circumcised, the, 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 then Simeon and Levi rise up and kill him. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dina from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives. They took captive and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites, and I'm few in number. Since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? And that's the, that's, that's the first mention, okay? This is really uh, just from my perspective. Go ahead and fact check me on it, but... From my perspective, from understanding the Word of God for many years now, this is the first mention of the concept, the idea of prostitution, whoring, wh whoredom, harlotry, and pornography. This is the first mention of it in the entire Bible. So this is the law of first mention. And what we need, to, we need to understand right away is that when this, what, this happened, this rape happened, the brothers got super pissed off about it and they killed everybody. Well, it killed all the men and kept the little ones and, and, and women alive and all that. But this was a th basically pornography, prostitution, rape resulted in bloodshed. This is the first mention of, of this concept of sexual perversion in, in the word of God, as far as this pornography and prostitution is concerned. 
And what you see, yeah, what you see is it led to bloodshed. Um, harlot, so should he treat her sister like a harlot? It means to commit fornication, just, you know, sleep around, be a harlot, play the harlot, act as a harlot, you know, commit even adultery, which is, you know, a little different than just whoring adultery being a, mar you know, when a, when a woman, you know, goes away from her husband, a married woman, you know, sleeps with another man, adultery, be a cult prostitute, unfaithful to God, play the harlot, you know, you kind of get the point. Should he treat her sister like, you know, a hired prostitute, basically? And so the, the, the practical application already, right, as we're beginning, you're already beginning to hide the word of God in your, in your heart and mind. Think about this. What if it were your sister, mother, your father, your brother? I know like Dina was a, was a, a woman, but what if it were your sister, mother, father, brother, your daughter or your son that's being trafficked, taken advantage of, or being exploited in some way, shape, or form on porn sites for someone else's twisted viewing pleasure? What if? This is the practical application. Meditate upon what the Word of God is showing us here, that this type of sexual perversion results in bloodshed and anger. I mean, wouldn't you be angry if someone took your daughter, if you have a daughter, um, your, you know, your sister, your mom? Wouldn't you be just a little bit upset? Wouldn't you be just a little ticked off? Wouldn't, wouldn't you feel sadness, grief, anger? Would you go through all these emotions? And yet, this is what sets you free when you begin to understand, wait a minute, that's, that's what I'm doing when I'm looking at someone else's sister, mother, daughter, someone else's, you know, if, if you're, you know, looking at porn, you're looking at somebody else's family member. This is how you begin to hide the word of God in your heart. Start to think and meditate about it in a really practical down to earth way. This is what former porn star Lana Rhodes has to say about the adult uh, perversion industry, X-rated industry, they should make it illegal. They should make pornography illegal is what she says. This is what she says here. Uh, this is from the Daily Wire. This is a new article just a couple months ago. Uh, the former porn star, uh, whose real name is Amara Maple, made a staggering 250 adult films over the course of her eight-month stint in the industry between 2016 and 2017. I can't even wrap my mind around that, that how you can in eight months do 250 films. I don't even want to like, I can't even fathom that, nor do I care to. But she slammed the industry for being infested with drugs and alcohol abuse and said that everything pe that people see is 100% fake and that it amounts to nothing more than circus acts. She also said that she is now pretty much asexual and does not enjoy having sex. This is what the porn industry does to people. This is what the porn industry is. It's fake. It's circus acts infested with drugs and alcohol. <laughs> and, and the people who participate in it, they walk away from it. It says, former porn star. You know, she doesn't even enjoy being a woman anymore. She doesn't even enjoy, she's disgusted with herself. At least you can read in between the lines and connect the dots. And and so, again, just just understand that as we begin to look at what harlotry, whoredom, and, and the concept of, of prostitution in the Bible is, remember that this, this has some serious consequences across the board, not just for the viewer, but the, obviously for the people that are doing the films and doing the stuff uh, in the X-rated industry, they call it, trying to give it a, a fancy name. The sexual perversion is, is, is it's really harmful all the way around. It, it, it causes bloodshed for everybody, okay? And, you know, out of all the verses, like Genesis 34 is pretty powerful. But the one verse that retrained my brain when I was overcoming this, let me share this with you. This, this is the verse. It changed everything for me. Like the chemistry in my brain, the way my brain started thinking, the patterns of thought, the, the one thought leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. How I started practicing the word of God in my brain and thinking about it, meditating on it. This particular verse I'm about to show you is the one that, it's such a go-to and I, 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 I'll be, I can't wait because I have a feeling it's going to be your go-to as well uh, once we go through this and I explain some of the some, some what's going on here. But Leviticus 19, 28, it says this, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo marks on you. I am Yehovah. Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to become a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. You shall keep my sab Sabbaths in reference, reverence my sanctuary. I am Yehovah. So 
the reason that I that I read those two other verses, 28 and 30, even though they don't have a direct connection to what we're talking about today, it's just that this this particular verse is very interesting. It's in a kind of a random place, but it also goes to show you that the Sabbath day, keeping that seventh day of rest, n- no tattoos, it, it's all, see what I'm saying? The Christian church, the Western churches have all been like, oh, that's for Jews. Oh, this stuff's all for Jews. And that those that that attitude towards the word of God that this isn't this is for somebody else. These words are are racially or ethnically, however you want to refer to Jewish people, but like this is ethnically not for me because I'm not an ethnic person of the Jewish whatever. That's that's a totally false satanic idea. And the devil has been using this so efficiently for many, 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 many years now, making people believe that large portions of scripture are not for them. Uh, they're for somebody else that, you know, basically making the word of God to be like racist or something, or like it's, it's for other people, not you is such a lie. It's so ridiculous because just as important as the concept of prostitution is and how we need to look rightly at sin and how we need to look rightly at whoring and adultery. It's the same way that we need to be looking at. Okay. What about the Sabbath day? Okay. What about tattoos? So I just want to share that with you. And again, the verse that retrained my brain, this retrained my brain. Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to become a harlot, to be a harlot. The word there, prostitute, is uh, halal, which is very interesting. It almost sounds like the word in Arabic for uh, what they consider ceremonially clean meat. But halal um, means begin, profane, pollute, defile, break, wound sexually. Don't pollute, profane your daughter. Um, And, you know, obviously at the time this was written to the Israelite people, but it still applies for us today. That... We are to be a set apart people. God's people are to be a set apart people. We're supposed to be holy, sanctified. To allow your daughter to be a prostitute is to make her polluted and profane, to be ordinary, common, and to be violated. This is what we're being shown here when we look up this word in the Strong's. It's 2490. If you go look it up in the Concordance, you're going to be blown away. And what else does it say? Don't prostitute your daughter, lest the land fall into harlotry, and the land become full of wickedness. And when you look at what harlotry is, okay, don't prostitute your daughter, lest the land fall into harlotry. Zana, you do a word study on this. Strong's 2154, lewdness, wickedness, mischief, heinous crimes. What did I show you at the very beginning of this video? The heinous crimes that are in the pornography industry. The land has fallen into heinous crimes, wicked devices. Look at thought. Wicked devices, thoughts, plans, purpose. Look, sin, what I'm going to show you is sin never remains the same. It grows into more thoughts, more wicked devices. Now we have laptops and smartphones. That wasn't around 20, 30 years ago, really. There was no high-speed internet. There was no widespread, massive porn consumption across all generations, like all the way from Gen Z to like baby boomers or whatever. Like this didn't even exist, but the, the, the land has fallen into harlotry. The thoughts, the plans, and the purposes are now consuming people to the point of defining who they are. Let me say that one more time. The sin of pornography has consumed people to the point that it defines who they are and it defines the thought patterns of the individual. And and we're going to talk about how, how to overcome that more in a second. But statistically, divorce, lots of divorces... Or, or lots of divorces happen because one person is is using porn. It's just the way it is. So look, look, we've looked at Genesis 34. We looked at Leviticus 19. Now we're going to look at Deuteronomy 22. Um, just understand really quickly that sin never remains the same. It always grows. And so the thought pattern needs to start becoming in your brain. You need to break the cycle and you need to start having different thoughts. I'm going to show you a really practical way of doing this in just a moment. But the thought patterns need to change, okay? So we looked at uh, all these scriptures. Look at Deuteronomy 22 in a second. But we need to understand the marriage, what marriage is, and a little bit of a dowry. Like, what what is a dowry in in the Old Testament? Because the first principle you're going to see here is that uh, sex, sexual intimacy, uh, God views it in, in a way that it's very valuable. Check this out. Exodus 22, verse 16, if a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed, okay, she's, she's, she's not engaged to be married, and lie, lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgins. 
So the principle number one, the seducer, this guy who seduced this virgin must pay for doing this seductive act and having sex with the virgin regardless of the outcome, whether this this girl becomes his wife or if the father says, no way, but you're going to pay me the money because that's that's a sin, you have sinned. So the point here is that intimacy is is serious. A virgin losing her virginity is a really big deal. We're going to see more about that in a second. But just understand there's a bride price. There is actually a price uh, for a virgin. I'm going to show you what that is in a moment. But principle number two, women are valuable. Intimacy is valuable. There is a price to pay and the father must give approval. Sex is nothing close to what it is today. Back then, it was viewed differently than it is today. Let's just put it that way. And it was, this is God's word. This is how he wants us to view sex and intimacy. And so this is sexual immorality. Here are the consequences uh, for godlessness. Check out what Deuteronomy 22, 13 has to say. Again, this is one of those passages of scripture that were instrumental in rewiring my brain. And I I really do believe with my whole heart that this is going to help you if you're in, in this place where you're overcoming this addiction. This is what it says. If any man takes a wife and goes into her and detests her, doesn't like her, hates her, doesn't like her, you know, that sort of thing. And charges her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her and says, I took this woman and when I came to her, uh, I found she was not a virgin. Then the father and mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the leaders of the city at the gate. And the woman's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man as wife and he hates her, detests her. Now he has charged her with shameful conduct, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin, and yet these are the evidences of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. Then the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him, and they shall find him 100 shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman, because he has brought a bad name on the virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He cannot divorce her all his days. Uh, so that's the bride price, by the way, a uh, hundred shekels of silver. Uh, that's the fine. Um, and he's supposed to pay the father <laughs> again. It just shows you that there's a price, there's consequences. Okay. Because what we're seeing here, what we just read is that a man, he takes a, a virgin wife, but he's like, you know, eh, whatever. I kind of want a refund. You know, I paid the dowry. The father said, yes, we're having the marriage. He goes into her. And it's like, you know, I got what I wanted, I guess. And, you know, I, I really don't, I, I don't know. I, I just don't like her well, for whatever reason. And and so he's basically going back on his oath of his marriage covenant. He's, he's acting, and that's why I said consequences of godlessness. There are, women are to be protected if a man is godless. Let me say that again. Women are to be protected under God's divine law as written down for us in his word, a woman is to be protected from a godless man. It's a beautiful thing when you actually understand what the scriptures teach here. Okay. And um, so when I was looking, because I, I really wanted to know like, okay, the evidences of my daughter's virginity. I wonder what that is. They shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city in Deuteronomy twenty two seventeen. 17. Um, I will say this right now. Uh, to the shame of all the Western religions. If you look at Matthew Henry's commentary and all these Western commentaries, they're horrible. Like they're basically worthless at explaining what that, what this means, the tokens of the woman's virginity, the evidence of the woman's virginity. Um, but I, I did look at some uh, Jewish rabbinic uh, commentaries on what this possibly was. And uh, one particular commentator said with authority, like, hey, this is like, why are people debating this? Because it is kind of a debate. Like, people are like, oh, we don't really know. But one commentator's like, guys, come on. This is straightforward. And I kind of like what he had to say. When it says that they shall spread the cloth before before the elders of the city, uh, after the godless husband says, nope, she's not a virgin, and they spread the cloth, um, um, what, they, what, what, what this commentator says is that an ancient... Uh, an ancient Israeli practice was that uh, witnesses, two or three, would go uh, out and stand outside of the wedding chamber of a newly consummated marriage. And uh, they would basically, once the couple, the man and his wife, were, when, when they were done with their first act of intimacy together as a, as a husband and wife, 
the, t- the witnesses were actually responsible for going in there and retrieving a particular cloth that they had sex on top of. And if, in fact, this woman was a virgin, then she would have bled during her first intercourse. And so that's what this commentator says. I'd like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. And so that way, the, the oath is kind of understood, like this vow, the dowry, everything, because it's a transaction here. Like, it's a, it's a contract. It's a covenant. And so everybody knows that this was legitimate. She was a virgin and like, there's no debating it. And that's what it means by spreading the cloth. That's just one commentary. At the end of the day, we don't know hundred percent what the evidences are or what the cloth really means, but that's a pretty good explanation in my book. But here's the other side of it. Okay. Here's the other side of the coin. So yes, women are to be protected from godless husbands, from, from men that are despicable and trying to give somebody a bad name when it's not deserving. like when the woman is innocent, but let, let, listen to the other side of the coin here. If the thing is true and the evidences of virginity are not found for the young woman, this is Deuteronomy twenty two twenty, then they shall bring out the woman, the young woman to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So you shall put away the evil from among you. Uh, just going back to the marriage and the evidence of the of the virginity is not found for the young woman. If a virgin daughter in Israel played the harlot while living inside of her dad's house, she was to be put to death with, with, with stoning. And look what it says. So you shall put away the evil from among you. It doesn't just say it in Deuteronomy 22, 21. It says it again in, in verse 22. It says it again in verse 24. So you shall put away the evil. So you shall put away the evil. And when you start to meditate and think about this, think about how God sees sexual immorality. Start to think about all the different angles of this. Start to think about the gravity of this. And you start to think about how God thinks about sexual immorality. And you begin to hide the word of God in your heart like he intended. And again... This is, what I, this is how we can tie this all in together now, okay? When you mess up as a recovering porn addict, if you cave in, if you give in to another session of porn and stumble, the first thing you should immediately do is open the Word of God and begin to recite the verses we have already covered. I particularly like Leviticus 19.29. Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to, become a, to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. And I particularly like Deuteronomy 22.21. Then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of this, her city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in the, her father's house. So you shall put away the evil um, from among you. Okay? This is the secret. Uh, what I have here on screen, I'm just going to read it, because I, I didn't want to like, it was, it was, oh, I just wanted to read like, oh, this, this is it. This is how I overcame pornography addiction. This is how I was finally able to get loose of the vicious cycle of consuming pornography, feeling guilt, shame, depression, be like, well, God forgives. So, and you know, and then be good for a little bit and then go back to it and then be good and then go back and then good and back and up and down and up and down the cycle of addictive compulsive behavior where you can't get a handle on it and it, it, it owns you and it, it literally drives you. You, 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 you feel like you can't have control over it. You feel out of control this is how you overcome. Like I said, get a Bible as fast as possible. Let's say you stumble into it. You start watching porn and, and immediately open up a Bible on your phone and, or computer, whatever it takes. And instead of loathing and, and wallowing in guilt, shame, and depression, think and meditate. Think, meditate, and consider how God views men and women. Marriage. Think about how he feels about prostitution, evil, disgrace, the land full of wickedness, all these things that I read. And even if you don't completely understand why the Bible says what it says, just begin to recite it in your mind. Immediately. I'm talking immediately. The split second after you are done stumbling. And what you're going to discover is that you're actually, by doing this, you're going to start to retrain your brain to think like the Word of God wants you to think. You're going to train the chemistry in your brain to operate differently. The neurons are going to start firing in different patterns. You're going to start meditating and thinking about the Word of God. I, you're not going to be perfect, probably. Sometimes when we become saved, we become regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, I've heard of this, like 
You know, it happens in people's lives. Oh, my alcohol addiction went away overnight. Oh, like my life completely changed overnight. Oh, like my life completely, I was a new creation in Christ. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This, this, and this, but you know what? For some people, myself included, even though I was a regenerated person that I knew I had received the Holy Spirit, I knew that God was speaking to me. He was calling to me. He was starting to lead me. He, my life was starting to change and he was actually leading and guiding me. I no longer felt condemned to hell, but I felt like convicted. And like I was, when I was doing wrong things, I didn't feel like I was doomed for eternity, but I felt, huh, like I'm being disciplined. Okay. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But what I'm saying is for some people like me, addictions or issues, they're, they don't go away overnight. Like some people do. Okay. And for those of us that you're overcoming a struggle and maybe it's been something that you've been stuck on for many, many years. God still loves you when you mess up. Let me repeat that one more time. God still loves you when you mess up. You are not condemned and going to hell because of what Yeshua did. You were actually able to repent and he's still going to love you. Okay. And, and this is the thing again, grace, this concept of grace, mercy, forgiveness. It's not something that's a new Testament concept only. We find it right here in Moses, Deuteronomy 8, 5. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so Yehovah your God chastens you. Yehovah your God chastens you. Escaping the worthless cycle of guilt, shame, and depression, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, you have to understand the difference between condemnation and conviction because you are going to have conviction when you stumble. Okay. If you're a recovering porn addict, you're going to have conviction, but look what Hebrews 12, five says, and you have forgotten the exhortation, which speaks to you as sons, my son, do not despise the chastening of Yehovah, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. When he's speaking in your heart, you're feeling rebuked. You know, you did wrong. You know, you messed up. Don't despise it. Don't despise. Don't be discouraged. Don't let your mind wander into the condemnation land where so many false religions are. For the whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Whom Yehovah loves, he chastens. It's okay to be rebuked, but it's not okay to be in a vicious cycle of guilt, shame, and depression going back to the sin of pornography, then going back to guilt, shame, and depression, never getting over it. It's time to overcome this. It's time to finally get over this by understanding that you have a loving father in heaven that is ready and willing and wants to work with you so bad, but you're not letting, you're not removing yourself from the equation and, and just, even when you stumble, looking at what the word of God says is beginning to meditate on it. I promise you, I promise you, when you recite the word of God, when you start to hide his words in your mind and your heart, you start to internalize the truth of the word of God. It will change you. It cannot return void. It accomplishes everything that the father intends. It accomplishes its purpose and its purpose is to set us free. Okay. Now I'll say this. Is there an unforgivable sin? Yeah, there absolutely 100% is an unforgivable sin, but you know what? That unforgivable sin is not looking at porn. (laughs) That unforgivable sin isn't looking at porn. You know what the unforgivable sin is? Go watch uh, uh, episode 12 of the podcast. But I'm not going to do that to you. I'll tell you what the unforgivable sin is. It's not allowing the Holy Spirit, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is what Jesus said, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, committing the unpardonable sin is when you do not allow the Holy Spirit to teach you all of the words of God. From Genesis to Revelation, you fail to let the Holy Spirit teach you all of his words. And I'll tell you right now, a lot of Westerners are in trouble because they keep saying over and over again that Moses and the prophets, eh, that's for Jew, that's Jewish stuff. That's mostly for Jews. It's dispensational theology. It's all for Jews and we're in the church age now. Look, I I mean, hopefully that didn't go over your head, but dispensational theology is a man-made thing. Uh, he's, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. There's no shadow of variation of turning. Okay. So, uh, all I'm saying is a lot of people are committing the unforgivable sin because they don't care about the word of God. They're not letting the Holy Spirit teach them all the word of God. 
and I pray that you're different, okay? Because blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, like I said, it's not long to teach you, okay? But be, be flexible, be teachable, even when you feel rebuked, even when you feel convicted, don't, don't stop learning. Don't allow the Holy Spirit to teach you, even in those most vulnerable moments. That's what a relationship with God is all about. Even in the most vulnerable moments that you're, you're allowing him to teach you, okay? The world is condemned already, but we are not. This is what it says in John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Okay. But look what it says. Look what it says. He who believes in him is not condemned. Repeat that to yourself. Repeat that to yourself. If you feel worthless and, and if you stumble as a recovering addict, and you're, you're starting to apply these principles of, of reciting and meditating in the Word of God, and what, how, what the Word of God sees as evil and prostitution and harlotry, and you're still in that phase where you might be stumbling, remember what this passage is saying. He who believes in Him is not condemned. The question is, have you put all your faith, trust, and hope in the Son of God, Ben Elohim, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ? Have you put your hope and faith and trust in Him? Did you believe His words? Have you received him? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Have you put yourself under him and, and submitted your life and said, yes, I want to do your will for my life. I'm no longer going to do what's right in my eyes. I want to do what's right in your eyes. Are you, have you become his disciple? Okay, because every disciple fit for the kingdom of heaven must, must treasure the word of God in their heart. Okay, and that's all I've got for today. That's all I've got for today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me for so long, for checking out Breaking Porn Addiction Forever, the strategy that I use to overcome porn addiction. It's not fancy psychology. It wasn't going to a thousand counseling sessions, group therapy sessions, getting together with a bunch of people who are struggling with the same thing and just like chanting at a wall and, and shouting and, and like getting excited and like having community and camaraderie that... that I would say artificially, maybe in the moment, helps you get over things. It wasn't any of that, but it was the Word of God that radically transforms, brings resurrection, and changes someone's life forever. And it will change your life too, if you let it. Next episode, I'm going to talk more about um, the spiritual dimension of this, uh, because there are such things as demons. There are such things as generational curses. There are such other things that could be hindrances into your road to complete recovery from porn addiction or any addiction. And so we're going to talk about that more next time. Uh, the spiritual dimension, really, this one was just, let's apply the word of God. Let's start to think how the word of God wants us to think. It's written down for a reason. It's been preserved all these years, all these thousands of years now for a reason. It's there for us to be instructed by, to meditate and to think properly about our, uh, those around us, the world around us, the, the porn. Now you can see with a very clear lens how God feels about it, and now you can start to become the man or woman of God that he has called you to be without the, this restraint, without this, this thorn in your side weighing you down, constantly creeping up every now and then, or maybe it's an it's a everyday type of thing. I don't know your situation, but you don't have to live in this bondage anymore. The Word of God can set you free. All right, like I said, my name is Abraham Ojeda, and I'll catch you next time. Uh, until then, be safe, be blessed. Of my regret